Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. In the last few lectures, we have studied that how structure can be excited using impact hammer. We also saw that how we get the measurement of force and how we measure the response. Uh, we also studied FRF estimates uh, and how to find frequency response function from the transient force and the transient signal we measured, transient response we measured. Uh, so in this lecture today, we are going to look at FRF measurement on a free free beam using impact testing. So, this is the you know setup for model test uh, for FRF measurement. So, you can see we have a, a steel beam okay, and that is being supported using soft elastic bands because we want to simulate the free free boundary conditions. Uh, the beam is of rectangular cross section and the length, width and thickness of the beam you know as shown here, uh, they, they are 750 mm, 31.5 mm that is the width and then the beam is 5.3 mm thick. Now the uh, response of the beam is basically measured using an accelerometer, uh, like being shown here. You know, this is the accelerometer. The, uh, the response is measured, uh, and then we have an impact hammer, like shown here, model hammer, right? Uh, with the help of which we apply excitation on the structure, and then the output of the accelerometer and the hammer, they are being fed uh, to an FFT analyzer. So you can see this is the FFT analyzer here. Uh, and then we require at least two channels in the FFT analyzer because we have two measurements and the frequency response function measurement requires you know at least two channels. So, it is a dual channel measurement. Uh, so, let us go to next slide. Now, this is the test data we are going to use. The hammer output is fed to channel 1 of the analyzer, accelerometer output is fed to channel 2. And then we have chosen 16 number of measurement points on the beam. Uh, and then we are going to perform a roving hammer test, which means that the accelerometer or the response transducer will be fixed at a particular location. Okay. And then the hammer would be moved from one uh, test point to the next, right, uh, for application of impact when we measure the FRF corresponding to those points. The accelerometer location has been fixed at test point 10. And then we are going to use a plastic tip. We want to do model testing of the beam over a range of 1 kilohertz. So now before we use the analyzer to take the measurement, uh, we need to decide the measurement setup for FRF measurement. And this basically relates to the choice of number of samples in the time domain, right? the sample length of the signal and then the frequency range has to be fixed in the analyzer. Then we also need to decide the maximum input voltages in the two channels. Uh, and then we are using IEP or ICP types of uh, the transducers that is the accelerometer we are using that is a IEP you uh, know ICP type of transducer and the hammer also is uh, having force transducer which is of IEP or ICP type. And therefore, these transducers require a constant current line drive supply that is a current from 2 to 4 milli ampere they need for their internal uh, amplifier circuitry to operate. And therefore, this needs to be communicated to the analyzer so that the analyzer uh, would deliver that much current and the power to the transistors. So, that also should be enabled in the analyzer. Uh, then we also need to supply the transistor sensitivities right? so that we get an accurate estimate of the FRF. Uh, then we also need to decide how the measurement would be triggered, right? how it will be initiated so that trigger sitting has to be done. Then if we want to use any windows for the force and the response signals, those also should be selected and uh, uh, you know, relevant parameters need to be set. Uh, and then the you know, kind of display layout we want, uh, like for example, we may like to uh, have a look at the uh, time signals, we may like to have, uh, have a look at the power spectrums or the frequency response, its phase. So whatever uh, we want to see uh, according to that, we need to choose the display layout on the analyzer. Let us go to next slide. So, the uh, first step we are going to do is select number of samples, right. So, depending upon the analyzer you uh, use, you know, there may be different options and settings, uh, right. So, in the analyzer which I am using, here we need to choose uh, in the input section of the analyzer, 
right that what is the sample length of the signal and you can see from here for example uh, the sample length is 2048 right so 2048 number of samples have been chosen the next uh, setting relates to the selection of frequency range of measurement and as we said we are interested to uh, measure the FRF over a range of 0 to 1 kilohertz. So, now this information has to be provided in the analyzer. So, you can see here uh, we have taken this 1 kilohertz here. So, there would be several options. So, out of that this 1 kilohertz option has been chosen. So, the frequency range is 1 kilohertz and we also note that here the number of samples that are also being shown here like 2048 right. And then these two parameters uh, once fixed now the rest of the all time and frequency domain parameters can get fixed. So, based on these selections the record length turns out to be 0.8 second okay? and the frequency resolution is 1.25 hertz as also indicated here it can be seen that is the frequency resolution. In fact, there are 800 number of uh, lines in the discrete spectrum. So, whatever you know spectrum we calculate based on these settings uh, there would be 800 number of frequency lines. Okay? Now, we need to select the input voltages, coupling and CCLD you know settings. So, you can see here uh, this in this window uh, we can make a choice. For example, for channel 1 if we see here for channel 1 we have selected 1 volt RMS, 1 volt RMS is the uh, maximum voltage right that this channel can accept. Uh, if the uh, voltage exceeds this then it would amount to an overload of the channel. Uh, so, this has been decided by first having a initial measure uh, or the measurement of the force and response signals and based on the level of the force and responses uh, the, these values have been chosen. Then for the channel 2 the maximum voltage has been taken as 31.6 volts RMS. So, in addition to this we also need to decide whether what kind of coupling is required. Uh, there are two options for the coupling like AC coupling and DC coupling. So, DC coupling allows a measurement of the DC voltage also in the signal right or DC components in the signal. But if the DC component is large then it would unnecessarily load the, those channels and so therefore we go for AC coupling uh, because then that would remove the DC component and then the signal would be measured and analyzed. So, you can see here we have chosen the AC coupling in for both the channels and then we also need to set the CCLD setting on right. So, you can see here. Uh, this CCLD is set on for both the channels. So, which indicates that the analyzer has to supply the necessary electric you know, power to the transducers attached to the two channels. So, the another thing uh, we need to set is the transducer sensitivities. So, you can see in the input section now we are going to set the engineering units right and you can see for channel 1 the hammer output is being fed and therefore, the unit that has been chosen for this channel 1 is you know can see newtons right that is the engineering unit of the signal that is being received by that channel. And then we uh, feed the sensitivity of the force transducer of the you know hammer uh, in the uh, unit section. So, you can see here in the in engineering unit value section. So, here you can see we have given the sensitivity. So, which is 0 0.001016 right uh, volts per newton that is the unit of the sensitivity. Uh, and then we also indicate in the engineering unit type section that this unit indicates the voltage per unit engineering unit which is Newton in this case. For channel 2 also you can see the engineering unit is meters per second square which is the unit of excitation since the output of the accelerometer is being fed to the channel 2. So, this is meter per second square. Right. And then the sensitivity of the accelerometer is in this case uh, the one which we are using the sensitivity of that accelerometer is 0 0.01043 uh, volts per meter per, se per second square and that is what has been fed here. And then the engine unit type is volts per engine unit type engine unit which is meter per second square. So, in this way we need to provide the correct sensitivity value data right? and this is very essential. Uh, right uh, otherwise the uh, the uh, frfs that we get that will not be appropriately scaled right and then when those frfs are analyzed the mode shapes that are extracted they would also not have a proper scaling factor right they would be more arbitrarily scaled so therefore it's necessary to have the correct knowledge of the sensitivity and to use that in the analyzer so that the frfs are correctly scaled 
let us go to the next slide. The next uh, setting uh, relates to the trigger. So, we need to decide that how the measurement would be initiated and that refers to what is called as trigger right and in this case uh, you know we are going to use channel 1 right uh, for uh, deciding uh, when to start the measurement and that is why you can see in the trigger setting uh, of the input uh, you know section uh, we have to convey that information you can see here. So, therefore, this basically says that channel 1 uh, signal has to be used to determine uh, when the uh, you know measurement would be assumed to be triggered or would be you know uh, decided how the trigger uh, you know, triggering would be decided based on the uh, signal from channel 1. And then the once you know parameter related to trigger is detection level right. So, detection level that at what level of the signal the triggers uh, would be set on. So, in this case uh, we have taken you know like around 2 newtons. So, when the signal in channel 1 uh, is just to 2 newtons right 2 newton of force then the, uh, the trigger would be set on right. Uh, and then another thing is that uh, we also need to provide the position the position of the trigger right or means other that indicates basically uh, you know with respect to the uh, trigger condition at what point measurement has to be started. Uh, so, what happens is that when the signal uh, you know force signal reaches to say 2 Newton level uh, then before that uh, instant also the force already is there right because it would start from uh, some small value or 0 value and then reach to 2 Newtons. So, it is uh, journey or the it is rise from 0 to 2 Newton is also there and that also excites the structure and generates the response. So, we would also therefore like to measure that part of the force time history right. So, that is why we have provided here minus 18 right which means that when the level of 2 Newton is reached in channel 1 uh, the recording actually will be started uh, 18 samples before that instant right. So, this would help us to cover that part of the force time history which has already elapsed before the trigger is you know detected. So, this is very essential right to in a, you know get a correct record of the force time history. So, in the figure at the top you can see this red line it shows uh, the trigger level right. So, that is shows the trigger level. Now, we are going to talk about any window uh, uh, if we need uh, for the let us say the force signal. So, here we are going to use the force window for the channel 1 that is basically which is measuring the force right and there are several options for example, for channel 1 uh, the, there are several options you know um, so rectangular henning flat top exponential force and user defined. So, out of this we have taken the force window let us go to next page. Now, we need to decide uh, the parameters of the force window right what is the width of the window when does it start when does it end right. So, uh, you can see here uh, uh, the here we have taken this is the start this is the start of the window and we have said that at 7 samples it starts ok and then it ends this is the you know end point and then at uh, uh, 43 samples is it basically ends ok. Uh, so, you can see in the figure uh, the blue you know that rectangular uh, kind of you know window that is nothing but the force window. So, this is force window. And this has been chosen so that the uh, the impact you know that is being applied, the pulse that is generated, the force pulse, that should get covered in this uh, narrow rectangular portion of the window. That is basically the uh, idea. So let us now try to see that what is the effect of this force window, right? So on the left hand side we have shown an overlay of the window with the force signal, and and before the window is applied. And we see that although the impulse that was applied has completely decayed, but even after that there is some signal which is there. For example, we see you know this part, this part. So, there is some noise in the force signal. So, with the help of this force window that this noise can be eliminated. So, on the right hand side we see the picture after the uh, force window has been applied on the force signal. And we see that beyond the portion where the pulse is being applied or pulse is there beyond that no longer there is any force signal right. So, all the noise which probably was there has been removed by the force window. 
Now we uh, decide the window setting for the accession signal. So we go to now channel 2 right and then choose the uh, window. So in this case because the um, accession signal is of decaying nature, so exponential window would be appropriate and that is what we have chosen. So rectangular window option means that uh, there is no window effectively, right. So if uh, we do not want any window then we can just use rectangular window which means no window being applied, whatever signal is being coming in the same signal is recorded. Let us go to next page. Uh, now we need to select the parameters corresponding to the uh, exponential window. So, so here we see that uh, so on the top uh, right hand side uh, the window function has been shown. So you can see it is an uh, exponential window function. Okay. Uh, so this window function attenuates from a large value to a small value and the ratio of this small value at the end of the window and the uh, uh, initial value that is referred as attenuation. right? So uh, and that is something we need to choose. So you can see here uh, in the parameter this attenuation has to be chosen and we have chosen a 1 percent attenuation which means that the um, value of the exponential function at the end of the time history divided by the initial value right of the window uh, that ratio is 1 percent that is 0 0.01 right uh, and then attenuation start position also has to be chosen at from what point the uh, uh, window uh, exponential window has to start and that we have taken as 0 which means it starts from time t is equal to 0 right. These are the parameters we need to choose for the window function. So now we are going to see what is the effect of exponential window on the signal. Uh, so on the left hand side we have shown the overlay of the exponential window with the raw time signal and these two are the zoomed views right and then on the right hand side we are showing the effect of the uh, exponential window on the signal after the window has been applied and now we see that uh, on the left hand side what we see uh, when the uh, window function is not applied the signal has not decayed completely. So we can see here the signal here uh, decay is not complete. When we take its FFT, what is going to happen? There will be some leakage. We studied in the uh, lecture earlier, right? That when the signal does not uh, decay completely, uh, then what happens when we take the DFT? Uh, then signal is assumed to be periodic, right? Uh, and then uh, because of that, there would be discontinuity in the signal, and then that would lead to leakage. So on the right hand side, the figure shows that the exponential window has forced the signal to decay or attenuate almost completely. Right, and that helps to reduce the leakage. Let us now try to see that if we are using a plastic tip, then would it be able to uh, allow us to take measurement over a range of 1 kilohertz. Uh, so for this you can see on the right we have the figure, at the top we, see we are showing the force time history. Right? So you can see this is the force uh, pulse, this is the impact force pulse that is being applied by the hammer. Right. And then uh, uh, the lower figure is about the power spectrum of the force right? and then the y axis is in terms of the dB and the x axis is in terms of the hertz uh, frequency of the signal. Uh, the spectrum magnitude is almost uniform throughout the range right? uh, which means that the signal has sufficient energy over the 0 to 1 kilohertz range and therefore it can be uh, used for excitation of the structure over this range. Now we choose the display layout, so we would like to have the time histories of the uh, two channels right the force history and the response history and then we will also like to see the spectrums and that is why we have chosen a layout where we can display you know four graphs on the screen. Now we choose what kind of uh, spectrum we want and we have chosen the frequency response. Okay? Uh, we would like to see the frequency response which is nothing but the FRF. So this now shows finally the uh, measured point FRF, right? So we applied impact at the location where the accelerometer is fixed, right? Same location, so the measurement will give us the point FRF, or what is called as driving point FRF, okay? And then the signal was recorded, and the force signal and the response signal they are shown on the 
uh, in the top two figures right at the top so this is the mm, this is the four signal and this is the excitation signal right so the uh, lower two figures show us the uh, main root of the frequency response function and the phase of the frequency response function so this is the magnitude plot and this is the phase plot okay so in the major plot uh, what we see is that in the uh, close to zero frequency also there is a mode right uh, that is due to the rigid body mode the system has right because we are testing under free free condition and so there will be rigid body modes so we see here for example here we have rigid body modes and then we have around six number of peaks appearing there so there are six flexible modes which are there and uh, uh, between every two consecutive uh, resonant peaks right so we see one anti resonance there right which is the characteristics of a point fr that between every two resonances there would be an anti resonance frequency so we see for example here this one this one this one so this one so these are all the anti resonance frequencies right and of course these are all the uh, resonant frequencies they are all the resonant frequencies uh, and the phase plot also shows change of phase for example we see that uh, whenever there is a uh, resonance being encountered then there is a change of phase from 180 degree 0 to 180 and then when there is an anti resonance encountered again there is a change of phase right so overall it looks to be a very good measurement uh, from the um, frf main root and phase plot we see that uh, there is not much noise in the uh, two you know plots right but let us also try to see that if we were interested to measure FRF by spectrum averaging, then how that can be done. So the first thing we need to decide is the number of averages, right? So you can see here uh, we need to decide the um, count that is the number of averages, and that we have chosen as four, right? Four averages we have taken for the purpose of demonstration. Uh, so let us first of all uh, try to see the um, auto and auto spectrums of the two channels right and that is why we have taken instead of the frf we have taken the power spectrum as the output of interest so you can see here now we have the uh, force and the uh, excitation time histories on the, at the top uh, right and then uh, in the bottom two figures we see now the power spectrum of the force signal and uh, the excitation signal so they are nothing but the auto spectrum of the force and auto spec so this is the you know, for the force power spectrum and this is the acceleration uh, power spectrum right so they are nothing but auto spectrums and then similarly uh, we can uh, get the cross spectrum between the uh, um, uh, response and a forcing forced signal right that would be required to find frf so now we would like to also see because we are doing averaging we would like to see also the coherence function so we choose coherence function also as the output so we will now have the two uh, time signals and frequency response magnitude and the coherence function so that we can see the quality of the frf we have measured So uh, you can see here this is the um, frequency response and coherence function when only one measurement has been taken. So you can see here we have chosen four number of averages but right now this plot is based on uh, now first measurement. So out of those four the first measurement has led to these plots. So from the coherence plot we see that the coherence is one throughout the frequency range. But this is actually misleading because for just with just one measurement coherence will always be one right because at each frequency the output and input can always be related by a linear relationship right irrespective of whether there is any noise in the signals or not correct. Uh, so now we go to the next measurement. 
So, you can see this is the estimate of the frequency FRF and Corans function when we have now two measurements have, taken, have been taken. It is based on two measurements, okay. Uh, and now we see that Corans function no longer is a unity everywhere, right. So, in this way, we you know uh, take the third and the fourth measurement, and this is what we get at the end of four measurements. Right, so you can see here now this is based on four measurements. Uh, so, what we see in the coherence now the coherence is low at certain frequency, and what these frequencies are? These frequencies are frequencies where there are anti resonances. Right. So, you can see this is the coherence very low value something like say 0.3 and that is at this entry resonance frequency. Similarly, this coherence dropping to a low value is due to the, at, at this entry resonance frequency and so on. So, at entry resonance frequencies the signal level is very low, right. The response is very low and that leads to, so if there is there would be some always a small measurement noise in the both the signals. And therefore, what happens the signal to noise ratio becomes very poor uh, low at these frequencies and because of which the coherence turns out to be much smaller than 1, right. Uh, so, but overall this is a very good measurement also because uh, the drop in coherence at the intrusions is expected, right. Uh, but at other frequencies the coherence is very good which indicates a very good measurement. So, therefore, this completes the measurement of point FRF correct and this we can save. Uh, and now we measure the FRF set other points the way we did for the point FRF right. So, in this way we cover all the 16 points that uses the one row of the FRF matrix right which is what is obtained in a roving Hammer test. And these FRFs then can be downloaded from the FFT analyzer and then they can be analyzed in a curve fitting software in a model analysis software. So, the curve fitting and how the analysis of these FRFs can be done. Uh, that is something we will see in the later lectures. So, in this way today we looked at FRF measurement on a free free beam using impact hammer. We stop here. Thank you.